Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Tucker Carlson Tonight. I'm Tammy Bruce, filling in for Tucker this evening. It's great to be back with you. You know, it's like the early 2000s again. Rosie O'Donnell has been having another meltdown over Donald Trump. This guy is in no means mentally stable enough to run this country, and he should be impeached, and every congressman who hasn't filed those articles should lose their job. Oh, well, there you go. We have more of that just ahead, plus Black Lives Matter crashing a police officer's own wedding. Parents, I just wonder if you started planning your wedding before you killed Stephon Clark or after, and how you've been, how you've been sleeping since March 18th, and I know this is supposed to be the happiest day of your life. He will not have that opportunity ever. But first, tech companies are taking the lead in suppressing any voices that dissent against the left. In the past few days, Apple, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, and other companies have all banned Alex Jones from using their platforms. Also, Twitter purged various libertarian accounts. Instagram temporarily banned Tommy Robinson. Facebook took down a GOP candidate's ads for allegedly being offensive. And a Democratic Senator Chris Murphy says mass censorship is needed to ensure, quote, the survival of the democracy, end quote. I guess he doesn't realize the, the irony there. Who's next? Uh, well, on MSNBC, some say Twitter should ban the president. Trump has insulted someone via Twitter at least 487 times. Is there a point yeah. in which Twitter says this is a violation of our ethics? We're going to shut you down. I think there probably is a Rubicon he could cross, but he hasn't crossed it yet uh, for, for Twitter, at least. Well, let's have this conversation now. Nigel Farage once led the UK Independent Party and spearheaded the Brexit campaign. He joins us now. Nigel, thanks for coming up with us. Thank you. Uh, look, uh, obviously, here's, here's the issue. This is nothing new, right? We've seen this happening for quite some time. Even Diamond and Silk is a very good example on Facebook. But you've got an uh, op-ed in USA Today, and you've got a very interesting idea about perhaps how we can start to approach uh, this kind of banning and this assault on conservative ideas on social media. What, what do you have to say. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has always claimed that Facebook was a platform for all ideas. Fine. You know, in doing that, he says, I'm not a publisher. I'm just a means of people putting out their messages. You know, whether you, whatever you think of Alex Jones and InfoWars, and, you, you know, you may say, hey, this guy's a bit out there. The point is, he's got a big following. He has an opinion. And if you believe in free speech, if you believe in your First Amendment rights, people should be allowed to do this. I would say, that by banning Jones, by shadow banning many others, Facebook and others are now effectively becoming a publisher. And that means, because they're taking editorial decisions, they should be open to being sued as other media organizations are. Now, I would argue, uh, because, we, look, we're all looking at try to how to find some balance here, because we do clearly see it's unfair. We, we see ranging from congressmen being shadow banned to, to celebrities who have the wrong opinions, might be somewhat conservative, that we're trying to find a, a framework, especially with uh, uh, mainstream media being 85 percent liberal. And we see yeah. that push. But we're the content in social media, which gives us an edge. But let me suggest, though, that some of the argument by Twitter and what they're doing is they're saying that these comments violate their standards. And if we open it up to, let's say, lawsuits for a libel, wouldn't it make it even more difficult to have speech? Wouldn't more people be banned? Wouldn't there be more people suspended? No, because if you're a platform for all ideas, you are not a publisher. That is the point. And what Zuckerberg and the other tech giants are trying to do is they're now trying to have it both ways. On the one hand, they claim, you know, we're not publishers, we're not open to libel because we let everybody uh, give their opinion. But on the other, they now, in a very sinister way, are starting to ban and shadow ban people. I mean, take, for example, on Facebook, PragerU, an right. organisation an that I've spoken for, I've been to their events. Uh, you know, they these do great are work. not. They do great work. Uh, they, they do amazing work. Yeah. I mean, their videos have been seen by tens of millions of people. They now, on Facebook, have 88 of their videos that are now very much put to the back of the list. They're very hard to access, including ones on Christianity, for goodness sake. Yeah. So, so we've gone way beyond the bounds. What is needed now is a Bill of Rights for people using the internet. You know, let's, let's give people access, let's give people rights, and if we can't get that, let's make sure we now redefine Facebook, YouTube and Twitter as publishers who are liable 
as are Fox News or the Wall Street Journal or anybody else to the content they put out. Yeah, look, I, again, we've got to find a way to push back. And one of the strengths we have uh, here uh, is that we are the content, right? Uh, and there's a sense also that we're, we're willing to put up with anything because our lives now, Nigel, are so intertwined, right? With Twitter, with Facebook, je social media in general. Yeah. It is the new modern way to communicate. Uh, and, and my concern, of course, is, is that uh, if they, we don't want them to go away, and yet, ironically, we, they're, they're private public companies. They're not a government. They, they can do as they please. But I think the power is, as an example, this conversation, our being able to have a, a, a point of view and make sure everybody knows exactly what's going on, because since we are the content, we can, uh, we can at least push back and make a difference there. Nigel, uh, wow. uh, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. Thank I appreciate you. it. Great job. Now, look, we've got to find some way to be able to push back. Harmeet Dillon is the perfect person to speak with about this tonight as well. She is a civil rights attorney. She represents James Damore, who was fired by Google for his personal views. She joins us now. Harmeet, welcome aboard. Thanks, to, thanks uh, Tammy. Happy to be here. Now, so what do you think of Nigel's proposal about holding social media accountable as publishers to where they'd be liable uh, on issues like uh, defamation, etc.? Uh, I feel that that would be kind of more, even more chilling because this is, they're not the government, obviously. They're, they're not compelled by the First Amendment to not act or, or to protect our rights. Uh, what's your take on how conservatives can protect themselves and push back in this regard? Well, I actually agree with Nigel. Sorry, Tammy. I Sorry, think that uh, it is par way past time for us to do that. And what Nigel is talking about is that these social media companies are all hiding behind the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, which gives them safe harbor, gives them immunity from being sued if they act as a publish if they act as a platform, not as a publisher. Right. The minute they become a publisher and censor what they do and what they don't, just like a magazine, just like Newsweek or whatever, they can be held liable, just like those publications. Now. Now, what these uh, social media platforms have done is they have absolutely, with their digital advertising, sucked the life out of traditional journalism so that, you know, the, the traditional journalism outlets are on their last legs. They're, they're teetering into extinction. And they're the places where they actually can get sued. If they do defamation, if they publish libel, they can be held liable. But these uh, other platforms cannot. Hmm. So between their market power, which I think is something that the DOJ should look at with antitrust regulation, and with their, frankly, false advertising to being uh, open to everybody, which Twitter promises, Facebook promises, and uh, you know YouTube to a certain degree promises, although they don't pretend to do that anymore, uh, they're violating the law. And so, you know, setting aside the First Amendment, I agree with you. This is not a First Amendment issue so much as a breach of contract and issue involving other regulations. Some of the other things that conservatives can do is that we need to have members of Congress look at this Communications Decency Act issue, pass legislation. But we already have some government regulations in place that could help us. We have the Federal Trade Commission. We have the uh, Federal Communications Commission. They could both take a hand in looking at the uh, uneven application of the rules to these different uh, See, But, Harmie, you know, I get, I get very nervous. I'm not a libertarian. I'm not even a Republican. But when we start seeing, and I think regulations can be very good. Um, you know, we've seen that when it comes to the environment, that government does have a role, but albeit a very limited one. When we start talking about government agencies deciding who has to be heard and what must be done, I start thinking of things like the Fairness Doctrine, uh, which made talk radio impossible to have. Uh, I, I worry about, again, this notion that when you're dealing with private slash public companies, but they're not, not the government at the same time, Google had a very big role in government in, involved with Barack Obama's administration. They themselves, the, the market share, the, the, the value of them are bigger than some countries. I mean, Apple yeah. just, I think, became like a, the first time the one trillion dollar traded company. Are you not concerned about government involvement in, in this marketplace framework where I think personal activism as co the content producers uh, can help make the difference on? Well, of course I'm concerned, and frankly, government involvement as a conservative is the last resort, but sometimes it is necessary. So, for example, where we have doctrines that require um, equal access to certain platforms, uh, you know, for example, you have Facebook censoring Elizabeth Heng's ads right. when the Democrat, the incumbent's not censored. That is, to me, virtually an in-kind contribution by the platform to one side over the other. We can't have that in our system under our current laws. I'm not saying new laws. 
I'm just saying right. apply the current laws to the situation. So there's Great that. Point. The other thing, the other thing is that um, you know conservatives can fight back in the courts, or as you say, we are the content. But you know, I'm afraid it's a little naive to say that. Unfortunately, we've had many years of uh, American consumers acting like sheep. You know, they think that well, oh, Google is well, free, it's, it can these change. things are free, and now we have, now now we're in chains. Well, we, now, we have now, to wrap now it they up. control our voices. We have to wrap it up so. now. I think this conversation is an indicator that things are changing. And thank goodness for work like yours, Harmeet. I appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Now, look, right now we're keeping an eye on Ohio, where there's a closely watched special election. We all know about it for, the, for a congressional seat. Republican Troy Balderson is running against Democrat Danny O'Connor for the 12th district seat. Polls closed less than an hour ago. We're going to bring you the results of that race as soon as it's called. And coming up, Rosie O'Donnell back with another anti-Trump meltdown. It's something to behold. That's coming up next. Let your voice be heard and let let the president know in no uncertain terms that we are alive, awake, and we are woke. We are not going away. The more people that show up here eventually will take over all of D.C. and will have no choice but to resign. All righty. Well, that was obviously Rosie O'Donnell protesting outside the White House. The president, of course, though, is in New Jersey, along with a group of Broadway performers. The hostility between Rosie O'Donnell and Donald Trump goes back more than a decade. But recently, uh, Rosie has been inspired to new heights of derangement. Yesterday, she had a meltdown on MSNBC. He should not be president, and I don't believe that he's a legitimate president. I believe if it wasn't, wasn't for Russia, he never would have won. He's a horrible horrible human with no soul and he has a very serious mental disorder there are so many psychiatrists who are trying to get out the duty to warn they wrote a book this guy is in no means mentally stable enough to run this country and he should be impeached and every congressman who hasn't filed those articles should lose their job well you don't have to wonder where she stands then she took her act to cnn and accused the president's supporters you guys some of you of being paid to attend his rallies First of all, people are paid, Chris. You know that. People were paid since he went down on the escalator. He pays people to show up at right, those but rallies. I don't that know that that's, but I don't know that that's why he gets tens of thousands at the rallies. I think he ca captures a well, lot of emotion for people. He doesn't get tens of thousands. When did he get tens of thousands at a the last rally? Tell me one. Oh, no, not at the, at the Tampa. I think they only had 9,000 seats and there were people outside. But, Rosie, I've seen them. He gets big groups of people who come out. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, gosh. Larry O'Connor is associate editor of the Washington Times. He joins us now. Uh, Larry, isn't it a sign of the continued detachment from reality to say that Donald Trump is paying supporters? In a way, I want all Democrats to think that because they really yeah. don't understand what's going on. Uh, you got a piece on this today. What's your take on this return of hers and this very strange approach? Well, I, actually, I want to go one step further. I think that every Republican running for election this November should just play what we just saw on an <laughs> endless loop, right? Let Rosie O'Donnell be the spokesperson for the Democratic National Committee at this point. It, it really is a new level of derangement, but also a lot of the things that she's saying that, that we just saw just patently offensive, not just to Trump supporters, but uh, let's start with mental illness. I mean, Rosie has been public about her own bout sure. with depression. Sure. I don't know if you've known anyone with real legitimate mental illness. One thing you don't do is accuse somebody of having mental illness when they don't or if they haven't said that they do. It's offensive. It, it uses the idea of having mental illness as some sort of uh, pejorative. It, it's obnoxious. She did the same thing with the president's son, Barron, and uh, suggested that uh, the president's son had autism. It's so out of bounds. She is just a, a horrible, horrible human being and now she's rallying people in front of the White House, Tammy. It's uh, it, it's it's disconcerting. Well, and you know, Broadway especially. I, I live in New York. Yeah. Broadway is an industry that relies on the tourism of middle America. It's it's average Americans. For some, it's a bucket list issue. But traveling to New York is is a fabulous, fun thing to do. It's their audience. And it seems to me, I know some people were there who were uh, like we're in Hamilton. Uh, yeah. But when you're and the tickets are not cheap, we're, we're <laughs> asking Americans to spend a lot of money to, to uh, see them perform. And, and I love performers. I think they're terrific. Uh, but isn't this and, you know, everybody's got a right to, to be political. But it, doesn't this harm It's considering the, the, the nature of what we've been experiencing in America? 
doesn't this harm beyond Rosie O'Donnell? This kind of activism, doesn't it harm both their industry and the I Democrat Party in general? I worry about that. I used to work in this industry, actually, before Andrew Breitbart discovered me and plucked me out of obscurity to be a political pundit, of all things. I used to work in the management business on Broadway and in Los Angeles. Right. And I love, I adore this industry. I adore the art form. But, you know, if the entertainment business leans to the left, Broadway leans so far to the left, they've fallen over and they can't get up. They, they really are. And, and I love the business, but the fact is, you know, Rosie was just saying to her fellow Broadway performers there at the protest, make sure the president knows you're alive. Well, he knows they're alive, but he also knows that all of those people that you're talking about are alive. The people from middle America who, yeah. who, who save all their pennies, they come to New York, they buy tickets to a Broadway show, and when they see what these performers think of them, what yeah. the industry thinks of them, they might go on a cruise next time. Yeah, and lo thank you, Larry, so much. I mean, this is a point where at some stage, Americans coming together, finding and, and focusing on what we do have in common, like better paychecks, raises, right, tax cuts, yeah. safer countries country. We all benefit from those things, and maybe it's time to start focusing on that. Larry, thank you so much for joining Thanks, me tonight. Thank Great. You. Well, now look, there's plenty of derangement to go around these days in Hollywood. Donald Trump's Walk of Fame star has become a consistent vandalism target. There he is with the pickaxe. On MSNBC, Never Trump Republican Rick Wilson became so worked up about Trump, he began cursing and the channel had to kill his audio feed. There's a bigger Never Trump movement out there. There's just a huge courage deficit in this country. Because of my past failures, and of course <laughs> it happens every day, we had to implement a seven second delay. So what you said will probably not make it out there. Yeah, and that's probably the best way. That's probably the best way to listen to Rick Wilson, who's with silence. Well, someone you do want to hear from, who I know well and I enjoy uh, her commentary, Kathy Aru is the founding publisher of Catalina Magazine. And this shows liberal Sherpa, and we say that with all <laughs> kinds of appreciation. She joins us now in studio. Kathy, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. I've enjoyed being on as a guest with you, and so it's a pleasure to be, to be sitting across from you. Now, look, you've seen everything we've seen. You heard right. Larry. Right. Uh, you know, Rosie O'Donnell, uh, you, she gets some attention. She's a performer. Right. right. Um, she used to be a comedian. I don't laugh when I hear from her anymore. D is not, with this, these, not with these lines, no. Well, yeah, so would you agree, I mean, is this, is this helpful for the entertainment industry and for liberals in general? It's been, a, a, you know, almost a year and a half. Isn't it time to just say, okay, let's find what we have in common, or, or is it all still too early? Uh, with Rosie O'Donnell, I mean, this war has been going on for 12 years. It's personal. It's really personal. When he was asked, do you call women pigs during the debates, mm -hmm. he said, only Rosie O'Donnell. I mean, it's truly personal, and then he became president. So this person you've had a war with for 12 years becomes president so she's out there she's not so funny anymore because she's so angry but well, maybe see, she's funny it, on, right? you know if you go to caroline's maybe she's hysterical but i reality stars are in congress now there's one in the white house so entertainment politics is mixing well, so. would you say though that that when it comes to their business that donald trump's having a better time than rosie o'donnell is or really anyone in hollywood at this point that right now at yeah, the sure, moment right I, now. I, I mean they're probably it's the american way it's the first amendment i mean they have the right to do sure, this sure and uh, donald trump was out there he had the apprentice but he was still uh, fighting with the birther movement yeah so do he you, he did both he juggled both so. do you think his star now you know west hollywood just voted not that they have a vote right but they voted to to demand the removal effectively of donald trump's star on on the hollywood walk of fame do you think it should stay there do you think it should it should go well he paid for it just like everyone else. People, People might not know that. They don't know that. He did pay for that star. Everybody That's, does. Everyone does. You, you, you buy this section, you know, it's, it's not like awarded to you and it's free. Right. Everybody on the, on the Walk of Fame pays for it. So he paid for that star. That is yes. his star. He rightfully paid for it. But if it is becoming a problem, if it's dangerous, if people are hurting one another over that star, Maybe the city has maybe to they should move. be removed. Maybe they need to remove the people to prison who are taking exactly. pickaxes. Exactly. Yeah, the police need to. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's not right. No one should, should vandalize anything like that. That's his star. He, he earned it and he paid yeah. for it. Now, look, 
you're you've got a really great attitude you're not letting the circumstances which you don't like ruin your life look she's laughing it's a liberal is laughing um, we have great conversations right. that don't make us miserable right isn't it wouldn't you say that we've or maybe you think it needs to continue the current liberal attitude of all rage all the time especially from Hollywood do you think that that's worn out by now, or do you think that's really the thing that, that liberals in Hollywood should be doing, is the continual I, perpetual outrage? I don't think it's all of them, though. We can't say all of Hollywood. We can't say everyone. That's the whole point. I, I'm a liberal, and I'm not I'm not losing my mind. That's, I think it's that's a small true. group, just with the GOP. I think both sides okay. have extremes, and both extremes are losing their minds. All right. Well, there you go, except for us. We are not. All right. That. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Doing her Sherpa best, fabulous stuff. Uh, now look, the Black Lives Matter movement also has a new tactic, wedding crashing. We'll show you uh, their attack on a police officer's wedding coming up next. This is a Fox News alert. Results are coming in in a closely watched race in Ohio. It's a special election for a congressional seat. Republican Troy Balderson is running against Democrat Danny O'Connor for the 12th district seat. Polls closed about an hour ago, and we will bring you the results of that race as soon as it is called. Now, fed up with blocking streets, apparently, and occupying college campus buildings, Black Lives Matter activists in California have a new tactic. One of the officers involved in a shooting death of Stephen Clark in Sacramento, California, was recently married. But on his wedding day, he had to confront invading activists. Parents, I just wonder if you started planning your wedding before you killed Stephen Clark or after, and how you've been how you've been sleeping since March 18th. And I know this is supposed to be the happiest day of your life. He will not have that opportunity ever. Hey guys, can you get out of here? Guys, hey, get out of here? So we came here hey to guys. drink wine and also you. just hey, ask you how you are sleeping. All righty, Robert Patillo is a civil rights attorney. He joins us now. Robert, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Tammy. Now, look, uh, for most of us who've seen that video, we understand the social argument about the need for, a lot of people talk about prison reform, but there needs to be justice reform. We know that there are problems culturally that we have to deal with. Uh, this, though, transcends a line uh, in that we wonder what is it really going to accomplish what is your point of view on this? Because this just seems, not only is it not really going to accomplish anything on the issues that we're facing, but it really is a provocative dynamic that changes this into such a personal framework that people are going to turn away from what the real answers could be. What do you say to that? Well, you know, Langston Hughes once asked the question, what happens to a dream deferred? And this is what happens when legislation is not created that will address the needs of people. For over a decade, people have been arguing and fighting and marching for the idea of comprehensive criminal justice reform in America. When it was hands up, don't shoot, conservatives had an issue with it. When it was taking a knee, conservatives had an issue with it. When it was I can't breathe, conservatives had an issue with it. What exactly is the protest that these individuals want people to have that will get them motivated on the issue of criminal justice reform? You know, we want the Let protests mention, to stop. We need to have an actual congressional right. leadership. Uh, you know, the White House, uh, Ivanka Trump and the president have both talked about the, the need for uh, prison reform or justice reform. That's a, a discussion. Many uh, black leaders and pastors have visited the president in the White House and they get attacked for talking with the president about policy and about moving forward uh, with the issues. Would you have a problem? Would you go and meet with the president? Do you have a problem with, with uh, black activists and uh, people, uh, at least within the black community, uh, who are leadership, meeting with the president to, to deal with these issues directly instead of invading a private citizen's wedding? Don't you think one would be more productive than the other? And absolutely, I agree with you completely. I, I have applauded, I think I said on Twitter earlier, I applaud the pastors for meeting with President Trump. Good. I Good meet with you. the president all day, any day on this issue. Frederick Great. Douglass met with Andrew, Jan J uh, Andrew Johnson in 1866, a former slaveholder, to work out issues. The only way you make mm -hmm. progress is by meeting, talking, and pushing through legislation. The meeting with the pastors and the president to push the First Step Act, it was absolutely necessary. We well, need then, Senator Grassley yeah. to stop, stop delaying the bill, get it out of the Judiciary well, see, Committee. We need less Robert, talk, more action. You're, you're, you're a civil rights attorney. This is a conversation. This is about getting things done. But Americans see on television this kind of action of people trying to ruin, as they mentioned, they knew. It's like, let's ruin this guy's happiest day in his life. 
you realize that you're not winning people. This is not a way to, to win friends and influence people. That, that this conversation about things Americans generally agree on, we're all affected by a justice system that's unfair. But, you know, isn't this the kind of thing that just keeps people distracted away from real solutions? You have to admit that. Well, oh, Tammy, unfortunately, these are the things in America get, that get attention. There's been more attention on this story than there was with the 17 pastors meeting with President Trump last week to push prison reform. Well, you can so talk to, me, we, you can talk to the mainstream do, media about that. that. That's one of the issues. Well, that's been, what is the that's president, been how is the media, media that's been covering the media president's everywhere. work? And when it's with the communities that the Democrats normally lay claim to, it doesn't get coverage. They, they don't want to talk about the president having success. Instead, and this is what you should be upset about, the media promoting things that make uh, activist communities look bad, and then they play into it. I mean, isn't that something you should be speaking out against? Look, if you look at the 1960s, if you look at the press clippings from them, they demonized the Freedom Riders. They demonized Dr. King as an outside agitator going into communities. Who's there's they? never an appropriate or acceptable way. There's never an acceptable way to protest until something is done. I think congressional and presidential leadership on this issue will be what stops Robert, you from I'll protesting. Tell you, we both All know they want the best is something done. The protester uh, in American history is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we know the coverage of that, and it was powerful, and it made the difference. So when media wants to cover something properly, they will. In this case, I think we're all being taken for a ride. But I, I love your position regarding the president and really having an influence on policy. Uh, Robert, it, it, terrific seeing you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you all so right. much for having me. Thank you. Tucker is back after the break. He'll talk to a Democrat who says his party has become far too obsessed with promoting abortion. That's coming up next. Since the retirement announcement of Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, top Democrats have made their support for unlimited abortion rights a major campaign issue. Do we deserve civil rights in this country? Do we get to decide what happens to our bodies? How many children we're going to have? We're generations from now, our children and grandchildren will wonder, what did we do? What did we do when they were trying to take away a woman's right to control her own body? Everyone who cares about saving Roe versus Wade will make their voice heard, right? Yeah! yeah. Michael Ware directed faith outreach efforts for the Obama campaign in 2012. He just wrote an article warning that, quote, Democrats are entirely too focused on abortion, end quote. And he recently spoke to Tucker about that article. What did you mean you. when you said that, that they're too well, focused on abortion? Yeah, sure. Well, there's a range of... Uh, implications of Kavanaugh filling this seat that concern Democrats from a democratic policy uh, perspective, from immigration to voting rights uh, to corporate power and workers' protections, and yet out of the gate, uh, it seemed like the only thing the Supreme Court was going to rule on was abortion. And you saw uh, major activists and even some Democratic leaders uh, say that the preeminent focus was on Roe v. Wade, which um, to many Democratic voters and I think many Americans uh, seems a, a bit off. Certainly, if you're pro-choice, uh, uh, you, you have a right to uh, ask questions and, and press Kavanaugh on that like any other issue. But it just seemed to be a bit uh, out of perspective for me. That seems to be a theme, though. I mean, I think there are plenty of people who think under certain, cer certain circumstances abortion ought to be legal, can imagine right. some circumstances where it ought to be allowed, but aren't on board for, say, abortions for sex selection or third yeah. trimester abortion. Think there should be yeah. some legal limits, some common sense limits on it, and think there are moral implications of it. But that's not the position of the party anymore. Why? Well, right. I mean, I think you're... Uh the, the party has moved quite a bit uh, on this issue, but it's been a relatively recent move. Uh, it used to be that Democratic Party, uh, throughout the party, people called for abortion to be safe, legal, and rare. Uh, Barack Obama called as president for the number of abortions to be reduced. We actually saw the abortion rate in this country reach its all-time low since Roe v. Wade under President Obama. So it's not too long ago that you had Democrats that uh, had a bit more of a humble approach 
approach to the issue of abortion, but uh, something changed. And in 2016, for instance, you had Hillary Clinton asked in uh, the final presidential debate about her views on late-term abortion, and instead of citing the Supreme Court decision on late-term abortion, or instead of saying that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare, she actually made an extended uh, case for late-term abortion. Uh, uh, we also saw in 2016 the Democratic Party platform for the first time include a repeal of the Hyde Amendment, which bans federal funding for abortion. And, and these aren't these aren't long-standing Democratic positions, and they don't need to be positions the party carries forward, especially at a time when uh, Democrats are out of power in so many places. I've met very few people, whether they consider themselves pro-life or pro-choice, who don't think abortion is sad. There's something tragic right. about it. There is a moral dimension to it, no matter where you are on the spectrum. That's why not right. just admit that? And why not say, you yeah. know, we actually don't, abortion doesn't make you happy. We don't a lot, want a lot of abortions. But if you said that yeah. today, I think you'd be disqualified in the Democratic primary. Well, if that's true, then Barack Obama would have to be disqualified. He called abortion a tragic issue. And again, he spoke repeatedly to his desire to see abortions reduced. But it does, there is an activist portion of the party that, frankly, Democratic victories seem to be secondary to them as long as, as, long as party leaders take the most unapologetic approach to this right. issue as possible. And I think that we've seen the cost for that. We've seen the cost of that uh, in President Trump being in the White House. We've seen the cost in uh, someone like Senator Pat Toomey representing Pennsylvania instead of Katie McGinty. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, my hope as a Democrat would be that the party would not take that approach in 2018. Well, you can see Tucker's full interview with Michael Ware on the Tucker Carlson Tonight Facebook page. Coming up now, the president's Twitter feud with LeBron James has liberals once again calling Trump a racist. Candace Owens joins us for that coming up next. The left will accuse President Trump of racism no matter what. But this week, their stated excuse is the president's Twitter attack on NBR star LeBron James. This president traffics in racism. How the black community has come to view this president as someone uh, who looks down on us and who has an attitude about us that is uh, nothing short of racist. These are no longer racial dog whistles. These are foghorns. The people of color who are attacked by their fellow citizens who feel emboldened to be publicly racist because the president is. All righty. Well, Candace Owens is with Turning Point USA. She joins us now. Welcome aboard. Great to be sitting across the table from you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. And this is kind of nice. And normally, if you're talking to Tucker, you'd be in a in a box of satellite. But here we are in <laughs> studio. Look, uh, you're a young African American woman. You hear everybody talking about racism. We know racism exists. Correct. And yet, with this constant harangue on the president, a man who has clearly improved the quality of lives for African Americans, the unemployment rate at historical lows, everybody having more money in their pocket, that really adds to personal freedom. What is your reaction to this kind of response? To a president who actually said to a lot of people that they're dumb, white and black, what, how do you respond to all of this? That's the exact key that you just said. So the left has been operating under this very bizarre assumption that you can't critique a black person in this country uh, unless it makes you automatically racist. That's ridiculous. That's false. I'm critiqued every day. Um, usually I'm called a porch monkey, um, and I'm referred to as a lot of racial slurs um, in my Twitter feed uh, because I'm a conservative black thinker. Mm -hmm. The idea that you can't think somebody has has a low IQ, a provably low IQ. Maxine Waters is not a smart person. Um, you can't say that because she's black. You know, that's ridiculous. So president insults a lot of people, black, white, Hispanic. He is, is definitely not looking at color when he talks to someone. Mm. And quite frankly, the way that LeBron conducted himself in that interview, and I don't want to take away from what he did, opening the school was an incredible, um, right. something, an incredible feat that he did. But Don Lemon got him in that interview. Don Lemon was the smarter person in the room, as Trump said. Don Lemon knew what he was doing for CNN. End. He wanted LeBron to say something about the president. They couldn't right. have cared less about the school opening. That's a great they point. were there to get that five-second yeah. soundbite to get him to say something nasty about the president, and that was going to be their news story. Unfortunately, he's brilliant on the court. He does not understand how to you operate know, politically. That, that's the obsession, is that the media has abandoned its, its job of informing Americans about a whole host of amazing things that are going on, including uh, the issue of jo the jobs reports, the nature of what the tax cuts have done. This improves the quality of lives for, for 
for everyone, but you don't want to hear about that. They only want to hear about things if it's negative about about the president. Uh, at the same time, you know, we are in a in a, a racialist dynamic where race issues are used politically. And LeBron James said, and this is everyone's right, that he, if sports is not enough for him. He wants to make a difference in the world. That's what, why we're here. We want to do that as well. Um, it, for him also, though, to accuse the president of trying to divide us and using the NFL take a knee protests, aren't those protests the dividing line? And isn't the president defending uh, effectively the country against that kind of racial division? Uh, that's exactly correct. And look, I would welcome a dialogue with LeBron James. I, uh, he is in this regard, an ignorant man. Okay, he does not understand this. I'm not going to refer to him as uneducated, but I am going to refer to him as ignorant. He knows very little, very but that's little about really politics. The rhetoric, though, everywhere within the black community, that is correct. generally. But would you listen, agree? The reason about why the they, they really hung on to this and why CNN wanted to get LeBron James and they wanted him, you know, they essentially attacked him without him knowing it, and they used him to mm -hmm. get this out is because what was also released at the same time, the Rasmussen poll, black support for Donald Trump has right. doubled uh, since last year at this exact same time. That's right. So their rhetoric to 29 percent. It's a remarkable transition. Yeah. Um, so black people aren't believing this anymore. So they're thinking, yeah. what are we going to do? They go back to what they always do. They bring a black idol and they have the black idol say to the community, oh, no, 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 this is racist and hope that we're going to be sleeping and we're going to believe it. But we aren't anymore, well, I think, unfortunately. you know, LeBron James, is a, is, he's a smart guy. Yes. Uh, and I think perhaps maybe the president uh, should invite him to the White House. Yeah, I would and have a look, conversation. If that's too much for <laughs> LeBron James, I would love to sit down with him and explain to him why the black community is yeah, responding. He's, he's, and why he's we a curious like this guy. President. He's a smart guy. He cares about the community, and I think all of this is a distraction. There's too much that we all have to do. Absolutely. So great. Great job. Nice talking to you, Candace. Thank all you right. so much. Uh, an NYU professor tried to challenge political correctness at his school and found himself targeted by the left. Now he has a book about that experience. He's coming up next. This is a Fox News alert. More results are coming in in a closely watched race in Ohio. It's a special election for a congressional seat. Republican Troy Balderson is running against Democrat Danny O'Connor for the 12th district seat. Polls closed about 90 minutes ago. Fox will bring you the results of that race as soon as it is called. It is time now for campus craziness. At the University of Minnesota, administrators are launching an assault on free speech as they are considering a new policy that could expel any student or fire any faculty member who uses the so-called wrong pronouns for other people. Experts say the policy will likely be unconstitutional, but that may not stop the left. Michael Rechtenwald is a professor at New York University. After he questioned himself the epidemic of political correctness on campus, he was attacked by his own school administration and later sued them for defamation. He now has a new book out called Springtime for Snowflakes. Professor Rechtenwald joins us right now. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me, Tammy. Yeah, look, you of all people know the nature of what's happening. You'd think, look, New York's a liberal city, NYU mm -hmm. is the most liberal university. With that, you think that it, all kinds of things are taught, and free mm -hmm. thinking is taught, right. and the encouragement of ideas, but uh, with this dynamic of mm. you know pronouns and firing people who don't use the right words, etc., this is not so far from what you would have expected, considering your experience and what your book talks about as well. Absolutely, what's happening there with the pronouns in Minnesota uh, is perfectly consistent with, with, with what I've documented in this book. Uh, I don't call them liberals; I call them the illiberal left. And they are entirely in control of the university system throughout the entire country. You know, and this is where we, you, we have to worry because, of course, once you, once you get out of high school, this is for many people their first experience with something beyond their hometown, with larger ideas, and it really has become a conditioning, if you will. It's, oh, it's, yes. It's like a conditioning camp. And then we wonder why someone like Alexandria uh, Ocasio Cortez, uh, the c congressional candidate here, is a dem democratic socialist, majored in economics but didn't understand how unemployment works. Right. So we've got people coming out of college who don't understand the, the, the fact. Because I, I stand strong, you know, they did, they did move my office to the Russian department, which is quite interesting. That's pretty funny, actually. Yes, it so is. at least still have a sense of humor. But what, what it, where it came from is what I track in my book. And it comes from a, a long lineage of thinking, most of it postmodern theory, but also Maoist and uh, Soviet uh, wow. Techniques and of disciplinary ideas. Well, see, that's what's so ironic here is that American liberals 
we, we stand against that. It right. was we stood against McCarthyism. It was even if you have an idea that people don't like, then you can defeat it with a better idea. Exactly. That conversation has to happen. Right. And that's now effectively, it's being killed if it's not already killed in the American university system. That's right. What they're doing now is that if you have an idea they deem discursive violence, as they call it, they don't allow you to even voice it whatsoever. And so they shut down alternative viewpoints. This allows, with lack of competition in the, in the realm of ideas, it allows the most outlandish things to pass out, uh, off as uh, legitimate discourse. So in your book, that becomes the issue. We know it's happened. Uh, what do parents do? What, what is the next step here? Are you suggesting something when it comes to defeating this or at least changing the yes. tide? Yes, I do. I mean, my final conclusion is that social justice ideology is effectively a religion. And so what we have is a religion being proffered as if it's neutral ideas and doctrine. Right. And so what we have to do is fight it I've as a religion. I've got to wrap it, we've got to wrap it up, but, but we'll, people can get your book, Springtime for Snowflakes. My name is Tammy Bruce. That's it. Thanks for joining us. Stay for Fox uh, for election results throughout the night. Good night from New York. Hannity is next.